Official art consists of pieces of art created with the support and encouragement of the state. In Soviet times the state was the only legal patron of art. It controlled all artistic life. For this reason, pieces of art displayed in public exhibitions, reproduced in art albums and bought for museum collections are classified as official art. Conversely, pieces of art created by artists who did not follow the state's requirements, who did not care about the reaction of officials to their work or whether they would be accepted into exhibitions and who only cared about the creative interests are called free creativity. It is hard to find a boundary between these two positions. Most artists created both pieces of art that brought them official recognition and the so-called free pieces of art that realized the need for self-expression. The limits on official art were not static. Artists continually looked for ways to expand them and get around them, and they looked for the ways to make free creation public. After Stalin's death, liberation from the fierce atmosphere of fear began in the Soviet Union. The 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the USSR, which took place in 1956, prompted these changes. During the Congress, the cult of Stalin was denounced and the demand for modernization was discussed. Issues concerning artistic revival were discussed during the first convention of the artists of the USSR in 1957. Social realism continued to remain the only artistic style acceptable to the state, although the need to expand the limits of its definition was expressed. In the same year, the World Youth Festival took place in Moscow. On this occasion, Western art exhibitions were organized. Works of art by Pablo Picasso and American Abstract Expressionism were displayed. Lithuanian artists associated the innovations of art with the nurturing of specific methods of artistic expression, the whole of which is called the language of art, and their goal was to validate these methods irrespective of the theme of a piece of art. The requirement to spread the right ideological spirit that has praised the Soviet ideology, continued to remain an official art. It was not easy to find a path to follow in this ambivalent situation. A version of compromise became popular. Artists paid tribute to the official requirement to create ideological themes, but they realized their goals of creative freedom in the area of form by exploiting the issues of modernism, which was topical at that time. The combination of a theme in modern form and an ideological theme became widely used in the 60s. This was started by painters from the Jonas Schwarzes generation, Vladas Karatayus, Silvestras Jaukštas, Vincentas Gatchas and Aloisas Tasulevičius. Traditionalism, which developed from the neoclassical traditions of interwar Lithuania, entrenched itself in official sculpture. During all of the Soviet period, this conservative and almost unchanging trend remained the dominant style of representative sculpture. Monumental generalized forms and frequent symbolic themes distinguish it. The most important orders from the state were monuments to the Soviet ideologists and war and revolutionary heroes, as well as memorials for Soviet soldiers and decorative sculptures. Themes of symbolic motherhood and family, especially associated with the images of the motherland and a happy Soviet family, became widely popular. The artists considered these themes acceptable because of their universality, which provided the opportunity to cover much broader horizons of ideas than the Soviet topics. Even though sculptures remain stylistically moderate, specific means of expression, the material of a piece of art and characteristics of the sculpture's surface, which were determined by the nature of the material and processing method, and the general silhouette were taken into account more. Lighting effects began to be considered as important components, conveying the idea of a piece of art. In Lithuanian graphic arts from the renewal period, specifically transformed stylistics of faux carvings began to dominate. Improvisation completed by professionals following motifs from folk art make up an entire layer of the Soviet cultural inheritance. The Soviets encouraged the coherence of professional art with the rural culture of the 19th century. It had to express the exaltation of peasantry. Meanwhile, artists saw folk themes and folk plastic art as a way to preserve national identity and resist the occupying regime. Folk art, which was expressive and usually of quite rough forms and creative techniques, suited the need of artists to draw back from the imitation of reality and the need to seek the specific graphic elements such as expressivity of lines, contrasts of textures, contrasts of black and white, as well as image conventions. The oldest generation of graphic artists Antanas Kuchas, Domicelia Tarabildine and Jonas Kuzminskis and the pronounced interpreters of folk art of the younger generation Albina Makunaitė and Aspasia Surgelinė developed this trend. This folk style remained popular for at least two decades, although it gradually changed. 
At the beginning of the 60s, former expressive and quite rough graphic arts became more and more graceful and decorative. The dramatization that was adopted from folk art was replaced by a decorative fairy-like style that was emotionally lighter. The renewal period did not last for a long time, it only lasted for a few years. It did not take a long time for the Soviet officials overseeing art to get concerned about the increasing interest of artists in the artistic movement of modernism. As early as in 1960, the so-called language of art began to receive criticism for dangerous deviation from reality, formalism copied from degrading capitalism and cosmopolitanism that harms the successful construction of a socialistic state. Attention to the correct ideological orientation of artists, which would guarantee high creative achievements, was required. The ideologically loyal painters who were established at the top of official recognition could allow themselves slightly more freedom in their creativity. Sculptors who filled the largest orders for the state looked for ways of expanding the repertoire of heroes so that individuals important to the Lithuanian nation would also appear in it. During the 70s, modernism started penetrating into representative sculpture. Sculptures of modern form were allowed to be built in public places. Such sculptures decorated new residential areas consisting of blocks of flats, constructed of large panels. Modernist features also appeared in the creation of representative monuments. The creative freedom of graphic artists also varied. Artists who created portraits of Lenin and other ideological heroes had to fit within a collection of almost canonical images. In other cases, ways were sought to expand the boundaries of the official requirements, which, however, had never been realistically, clearly and openly formulated. The end of the 50s was a prosperous period for typical architecture. At this time, a lot of attention was paid to interiors of homes and their decoration. In 1959, in Vilnius, examples of standard flats were built. The slogan, Art for Everyday Life, which emerged in this context, stimulated the turn of decorative arts and crafts towards functionalism, which was the dominant style of the 20th century. Laconic utilitarian forms and economical and modern expression are characteristic of it. The young artists who tried to work in the modern style were interested in developments in design abroad. They grew to like geometrical forms, coarse factures and stylized decor with ethnographic motifs. The trend, called festival-like, which came from the International Festival of Moscow, became popular for such works. Textiles and ceramics were dominant areas of art and crafts in Lithuania. Artists created samples of mass production, which were produced by daily factories that operated in Vilnius, Kaunas and Klaipeda, as well as by textile plants and the Lenferis carpet plant. In 1957, in Vilnius, a furniture design office was established. Designers who worked there had the opinion that furniture had to be comfortable, light and designed for mass production, and that its beauty had to be part of the construction techniques and the characteristics of materials from which it was made. The modernization of architecture started from public interior designs. The development of Lithuanian architecture in the second half of the 20th century was the same as in the rest of the world, but it was late. The rational trend, which had constructionist and functionalist features, was pronounced in the 60s. Projects created in stages by Vitodas Edmundas Chekanauskas belonged to this trend. These works show that rational architecture changed from strict geometry towards plasticity. Buildings of sculpture-like forms and of dynamic spatial composition were designed in the 70s and 80s. They belonged to the trend of late modernism. The number of buildings was increasing, which conformed to irrational architecture, the plasticity and visually expressive composition of which reminded people of sculptures. Beginning in the 60s, much more attention was paid to the synthesis of decorative arts and crafts with architecture. Interiors and exteriors of public buildings were decorated with pieces of art that were created especially for them. Metal decorative works, ceramic panels, ceramic decorative sculptures and flat three-dimensional stained glass pieces were intended for this purpose. Unique decorative wall carpets, were the favorite genre of textile artists. Sometimes, these were intended not only for decoration, but also for the separation of spaces. In 1985, in the USSR, the processes of democratization and liberation began. For artists, that meant opportunities for unrestricted creation.